Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Rebelo. I am the Senior Director of Communications here at the Buck. I don't know about you, but when it comes to being September, I get in back to school mode. So um, what a better way to celebrate that than by welcoming all of you to our sixth event in our Live Better Longer Community Seminar Series. Um, today, we are gonna learn about nutrition and aging. Couple quick housekeeping notes before we get into it. If you haven't put your phones on silent, please do so. And also, I like to make the uh, fire marshal happy. I point out the emergency exits at the back of the room. So, how many of you are new to the buck? Great. So, uh, I want you to know about our science. Better than me telling you is the folks who actually do the work. So Joran, please play the video. The Buck Institute is interested in understanding aging, not only to make us live longer, but to actually alleviate and suppress the development of diseases. Chronic disease is the great health challenge of our time. Aging is the main driver of chronic disease. To eliminate chronic disease, we must harness the biology of aging so we can live healthy longer. The Buck Institute is the world's first research organization dedicated solely to the biology of aging. We work with the building blocks of biology to understand how we age, the book is concentrating on really trying to go to the root of the problem, so understanding that we can sort of intervene really early. The Buck Institute is probably the best place in the world to be working on aging because there's so many different aspects of aging that are being studied. It's key because no one lab can do it all. Our scientific explorers are brilliant, curious, and commit it. The idea that you could actually develop drugs that slow down the aging process was really something that 20 or 30 years ago, people thought this cannot be done. Not only can it be done, but we will do it. The pieces are in place. And we are in a unique position to put them together. Our world is defined by paradigm shifts, created by scientific discoveries. The biology of aging is the next frontier. We're working toward a world where healthcare is better. It's a world where if we can eradicate the aging component to disease, we're all gonna live healthier and longer. It's just an incredible vision that really will you know, surpass anything else that we've ever seen before. We are inviting you to a future of aging without illness. It's happening today, and it's happening here. Join us. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank our sponsors. They're listed in your program. I also want to make sure all of you have note cards so you can ask questions during the event. If you have a question, raise your hand. A volunteer will come, pick them up, and get them up to me. I also want to give a special shout out to folks who are on Zoom. We have lots of folks on Zoom today. You get to ask questions too. Put them in the Q&A box and we'll get them and somebody will bring them up to me. Now, for the main event. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pankash Kapahi, who is affectionately referred to as PK by many of us who have the privilege of working with him. Um, his lab focuses on nutrition at the molecular level in order to understand how our diets impact aging and age-related diseases. You can read about PK's educational background in the program. Let me tell you that he is a busy guy. He's had world-famous mentors. He's published more than 80 papers, 
has three patents, and is about to launch a clinical trial here at the Buck based on his science. We're going to talk about that during today's event. One final note, PK is a PhD. He is not an MD. So nothing discussed today should be taken as medical advice. Please, please talk to your doctor before you institute any major lifestyle changes. That said, we welcome your questions. Please make them of general interest so they can ap appeal to as many people as possible. Pankaj, we got lots to talk about. Come on up. So can everybody hear me? You're all good? OK, great, cool. Oops. I forgot the blinker. That's my, this is my power moment here at the Buck. I get to do this. OK. Now, if it only worked. Joran, you want to give me the next slide? Keep it, keep going. OK, there we go. So I'm going to start the conversation while you guys start thinking about your questions. So Pankash works a lot on glycation and something called advanced glycation end products, which interestingly are called ages. So, PK, what are ages, um, and why are they not such good things for aging? Thank you very much. First of all, I just want to say thank you. I mean, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I just want to say preface everything I am saying. Some um, I come here to also. These, these sort of events are wonderful to learn new things for me as well, and hopefully uh, we can have a good discussion. Because I think sometimes um, in the lab, we get to know too much about too little. And I think these kind of events are very useful in sort of giving um, a wider perspective and making us think outside the box. Um, so I, I relish these events. So getting to your question, um, so I think one of the questions we're tackling in the lab, um, you've heard a lot about sugar is bad for you. Right, and unfortunately, we don't know why sugar is bad for us. So even we know we have got to keep our sugars low, but most doctors even don't go beyond that. Why is sugar bad for you? What uh, what's really detrimental about sugar? And I want to have you guys take this picture home, like. Every time, um, what, what are glycated products? So we are, what, this is one of the hypotheses, I just want to say. So our high, working hypothesis is that sugar create, when you use, when a cell uses sugar, it creates toxic byproducts. What are these? I'll get to in a minute. Um, and these toxic byproducts are what attacks the protein, the DNA, the lipid. So this is damaging everything in the cell. And slowly this, this damage accumulates over time. And that's why we think that's part of the process of what's, why it's driving aging. But also, it's, it's also very evident when you have high sugar, so in diabetes. So for example, diabetes, we all know about keeping our sugar down. But the, the most dangerous thing about diabetes is not the high levels of sugar. It's these uh, what we call diabetic complications that happen afterwards. So when you have had a couple of decades of, let's say, high sugar, increased risk of neuropathy. One of the leading causes of blindness, diabetic retinopathy. Um, you've got kidney disorder, more than 50% of chronic kidney diseases due to diabetes. Um, increased risk of dementia. Um, then one of the biggest risk factors for cardiovascular disease, stroke. All this is, um, sugar is essentially fueling or, or accelerating this damage. So we think of, there are parallels between what's happening with aging process, but which is sort of, which gets accelerated in diabetes. So I want to, um, you're talking about sugar, which I think is great, but just to give these people the sorry news, you get ages not just from sugar, right? Right, so I was going to say, so advanced glycation end products, for you to remember this quickly, every time you're making toast, right? So essentially your bread has, when you heat up sugar and amino acids, you formed what are called glycated products. This is the sticky stuff, which is very tasty, which you're all used to. Every time you make toast, you actually create about 50 new flavors. That's why we love it. And, and those are actually glycated, advanced glycation end products. And we call them advanced because once you, no one can get bread out of toast. Right? <laughs> so that, that's why, the, and the same thing is happening in our body. We're slowly toasting away. That's the unfortunate. <laughs> 
And um, we've done, I've done this in the past with PK, and he is not a popular person at, at picnics. Yeah. What, what, what happens when you go to picnics? Oh, yeah. I've stopped talking too much about it, basically. <laughs> But barbecued food and all that, you know, these are, so uh, in addition to taking glucose, there are a lot of studies are uh, showing that, you know, the more you cook the food, the more it ages you will make, they're not good for you. I mean, for example, there are studies even showing um, some diabetics have been able to reverse their diabetes by going on, on well, it, by going on a diet which is raw, right? And that's a raw diet is part, part of the reason, the two reasons I think raw diet works, one is, we're, and we're finding this in the lab as well. If you just give those ages directly to an animal, that is toxic. It shortens their lifespan, causes insulin resistance, help makes them gain, um, um, makes them obese. So without even changing the calories, that is enough. And that stuff is addictive, even to small worms and even to a mouse. They will eat more when you put more of these ages. So this is sort of fascinating things we're learning about this. So the raw diet works, one I think, is, is this part that ages are detrimental. And secondly, you just can't consume the same amount of calories if you don't cook your food. We all know this from experience, right? It's just not as easy to take in 3,000 calories if you, would, if you were to go on a raw diet. So I think, it, so, so it's good to kind of Moderation, well, you know, I know we don't want to take everyone's happiness, but, uh, but you know, when you can avoid it, when you can cook your food, like boil it, for example, rather than uh, dry heat is what makes ages faster. But if you cook, for example, with vinegar, that reduces that. Or if you just steam it, that that's, makes less ages. Fried food, again, very complex thing, very bad, because the number of chemicals you're generating when you're frying food, um, is a mess. I mean, we don't even know what's happening. The chemistry is so complex. But people who have studied that, it's like 5,000 plus chemicals arise when you're frying. But I mean, I, I'm not saying give up frying. I know, you know, it's tasty. My kids will not eat the food if I started serving them, like, you know, without frying and stuff. Yeah. And when we're younger, is it true our bodies? Na our bodies can naturally clear these ages. Right. But what happens as we age? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's like, uh, think about this, like, when you're young, you know, every, you can do anything, you're invincible. When you're older, even getting out of bed is like, you need a motivational speech, you need a chiropractor. <laughs> and I, I think it's the same thing with, uh, with ages, right? Like, you just, the food takes its toll. I mean, we just can't do the same things we were doing when we were younger. So part of it is detoxification of this stuff. So the body has in place a system to deal, to detoxify this, there are multiple steps. It, it recognizes, it detoxifies it, and then it clears it out of the kidney. And one of the interesting things is, um, the body, act, what we're finding is, um, the body switches on the inflammation response when it sees glycated molecules. And also the same thing is happening in a cell. Like I said, this metaphor of we're toasting away, I mean, it's, that's what we, we measured this in the cell. Because as a cell is using glucose, these byproducts are coming, and all, um, you know, just imagine all the proteins and the lipids are getting uh, modified. They're not what we started off with when you're in, especially the long-lived proteins. For example, your collagens, all that, all that's going to get glycated. The body starts responding to that by essentially increasing inflammation because it says there's something foreign in your body. Because imagine a protein, um, which when, you, when your cell produces it, it knows this is normal and it will not react to it. But now imagine you change it through glycation. Now the body senses this is a foreign protein. So that's what we're finding and that's part of the whole response of what's happening. So um, I want to let you know that you are all going to get an email following this with a link to today's event. I'm also going to include some articles about advanced glycation end products so that um, you can dig deeper in it and understand it. So I just want to talk briefly too about ultra processed foods, bad news. Those things, they're, they're loaded with ages too, right? All right, I mean, I, this is one of the fun parts I learned. Ages is not, I mean, yeah, I'm telling you the bad side, but think about the industries that rest on this. This is like a trillion dollar industry. 
People spend millions of dollars to make our cornflakes taste just right, and all you're doing is roasting them and changing them in ways essentially to have the right levels of ages so we find them more palatable. So think of the industries that are essentially using, I mean, we've been doing cooking forever. We know, you know, that's how we make our food tasty. You just have the right combination. There's a quote in, in India, uh, you know, that, uh, that the, the, you give all the credit to the chef, but it's really the oil and the frying that does the job. Right? And, uh, and I, I, I mean, I think about it and it is so true. And so, we, so we've been using that chemistry forever, um, but now, we're learning that that is not as good for you. Yeah, it's, it's great for taste, but it's not um, good in the long term. Yeah, and eating that more often is, is going to be a problem. You can deal with it once in a while, but yeah. Can I have the next slide, Jorn? Whoops, let's go back, go back. So yeah, go. all processed food, you know, and in addition to all the problems, it's creating more ages in your body, um, yeah, which is a big problem. So. Let's talk a little bit more about sugar versus fat burning. So what, yeah, what the so heck I happens? Say this, so uh, I want to say my, my research is a lot of it started in Drosophila and, and C. elegans because we use these systems to ask questions about these very complex things much faster. Flies live only about 30 days, you know, 30 to 60 days. So we can almost double the lifespan of the flies by putting in the right diet, right? And and. One of those things, one of the things we've learned uh, from these experiments is you want to be in a state, uh, a metabolic state, when you're, where you're burning fat, not sugar, right? Because when you're burning sugar, a cancer cell actually burns sugar. So what's happening when you're burning sugar, when you want ATP very quickly, you burn sugar. So when a sprinter burns sugar, they need sugar for that 10 second sprint. Right? But a long term, uh, a long distance runner doesn't run it on sugar, they run it on fat. Right? So you want to, uh, the endurance, so I just want to explain the physiology, well, what's happening. So what we're finding is that animals, when they go on a, let's say, a fasted state, right, or a caloric restriction condition, you switch over from burning sugar to burning fat. And what we're finding, and this is part of what we're trying to understand, why is that good for you? Right? And partly, I think it's what I said, when you're burning sugar, you're also making more toxic products. We think fat might be a cleaner fuel, makes ATP slower, it's a slower way to generate energy, but the body doesn't need it that much faster. But, but at nighttime, for example, during the day when you eat, you're more in the sugar burning state, at nighttime you're in the, in the fasted or in the fat burning state. Next slide, please. So maybe uh, let me add a couple more things to that. Okay. Because it's very uh, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the other problems that happen when you're burning sugar, um, and this is really interesting. And maybe um, I think uh, to think about it this in terms of evolution. I like to think about whatever we're going through in terms of evolution. So, like, why why do we like sugar more, right? And why is well, uh, and why why is one of the other like not only is it bad when you're using it metabolically, but also when you're taking it, what's the problem? And I, I don't know, the, the simplest explanation I can think of is that imagine when we were out in the wild, right? When you find a meal, you want, it, there's an insurance policy. Okay, you don't know where your next meal is. No one knows where our next meal is. Even though we have a refrigerator, our brains are not wired to understand where the next meal is coming. Right? So it says, well, eat more, right? So I think these mechanisms are in place because we lived in what you call bust, you know, famine, um, bust and boom sort of situations. So whenever the body senses, uh, gets food, we're wired to eat more than we need. And then there's a very, uh, you know, I think there's a Japanese sort of dictum that always eat 70, 80%. That's always healthier for you. And it's for this reason, because we're pro, I know all animals. That's why you don't feed animals in the zoo. That's why, you know, even in our lab, you leave the animals to eat whatever they want. They will always overeat. And same thing you can see around, you know, the two thirds of America is overweight. It's because if, if we have access to calories, we'll overeat. And I, I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we're wired like that. Um, so what we're finding is that sugar, um, switches on the parts of the brain that tells you food is here, go, t go grab it. 
And that's why, that it's another reason why it's not good to be in the sugar burning state. And I think there's some more complex stuff which is kind of fascinating. Think of how your brain works when you are in the sugar burning state versus a fat burning state. So there's a lot of studies now showing that when you're in more of the fat burning state or the keto, you're more attentive, you're more, you're more focused. Whereas in the sugar burning state, we'd be what you'd call more a hedonistic state because that's, it's a pleasure state. Um, and actually it's very interesting, if you look up the images of people um, um, when they're on like cocaine or for people who are overweight, the same parts of the brain light up uh, in those conditions. So it's kind of fascinating to think what else is going on, how, the, how our behavior is also hijacked by, by nutrients. Uh, do dates qualify as a harmful sugary food? And how do we deal with like fruits and stuff that have like natural sugar? Yeah, I mean, that for me is one of the biggest uh, motivating factors to not get diabetes. So I can eat my fruits and I can eat dates and things like that. Because, you know, I think that there can come a point when you overdo all this that you're not, you know, you should be staying away from certain um, certain vegetables and fruits. And this gets into a very complex area. There's a, there was a very interesting study done with 5,000 plus people, everyone having glucose monitors, and then testing these different foods. So what happens? The results were very surprising. The results get to this point I, I want to emphasize, I want you guys to all leave with, is it is so individual that it's mind boggling. That what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the other person. There's so much going on when you take in some kind of food. It's gonna get, first of all, by the way, someone wanna answer this question, who eats the food we eat first? Who eats the food? We don't have first dibs at our food, by the way. Right? It's our bacteria, okay? They're, they're called commensal organisms. They dine together with us, okay? So they take, they take first shot at the food and, and we change by depending on what we kind, food kind we eat. Like for example, high sugary foods will change the gut microbiome such that you, they are telling you to get more of that stuff. I mean, this sounds shocking, but this has been, now more and more studies are showing this, and just taking that bacteria and transplanting it in another person or animal makes their, changes their behavior as well. So obesity, many, uh, this has been shown that if you take bacteria from an obese individual, transplant it, the other person becomes obese, because what's happening is you've totally rewired the, the microbiome. And so it's very, that's another reason to think very carefully about the kinds of food you're eating, because that's gonna change. So sugar is not good for that, but we'll get into like fiber is key for that, to keep those bacteria, I'd say, the good bacteria, the healthy bacteria, uh, to propagate them, you wanna have enough fiber, otherwise they run havoc. So is that why the, the question about dates, so dates? So I think I, I would say things with more fiber, like dates, again, I, you know, personally uh, to see what works for you, uh, but, but dates can be good because there's, there's, they're rich in fiber. Um, but you know, anything that releases sugar faster, anything that is not whole is by generally a problem. Anything that is processed is made so that you're gonna get your hit faster. Um, and, um, and, and by adding more fiber, one of the things you can do to your, your diet is bring down this sort of sugar spike. Right, so, so wherever you can externally add fiber or take in a food with high fiber, that, that those are all good, good ways to sort of eat, yeah. Next slide, please. There we go. Right. So, couple things with this one. Um, how many of you have heard of intermittent fasting or heard of fasting? Very popular, lots of folks here do it at the buck, so I'm gonna have PK talk about that. And then we got a question about how to eat for sleep, and I know that's sort of tied into yeah. this too. So, yeah. so what's, the, what's the science yeah. behind intermittent fasting? And then I'm also gonna ask you yeah. about What's it mean for older folks maybe who never have done it? Like if yeah. you want to try it. So, but first give us the overview. First I want to draw your attention to this picture. Thank you for putting this picture. It's a postdoc, a postdoc's uh, partner actually drew it for us. Uh, and it was a cover of the journal where we were submitting this work. But 
just to demonstrate. We have fun when we do all these kind of things. But the idea is, uh, so this picture, every detail there had some meaning. So the idea was on the right side, yeah, on the right side is the image of the fly that is under dietary restriction or intermittent fasting. And, and you can see things are greener. There are more curves and valleys because circadian rhythms in the day, you know, all, all more than, the idea is maybe 30, 40% of our genes and our, you know, metabolite cycle. So now cycling is very important. So what we learned from this study was, to our surprise, when they were eating less, they were cycling, all the functions were cycling better, which meant, uh, for example, take fat burning. So these animals were much more efficient at taking in food, storing it away as fat, but more importantly than breaking it down. Right? And that's the, what I was saying, fat burning, you can't just burn fat, you have to make it too as well. So making fat is a healthy thing. Another one of those things I want you to think about in terms of evolution, fat evolved as a tissue to save us, to protect us, to so make sure that we don't die right away when this food runs out, right? But when it's not broken down on the left, right? So when you're in a condition of constant abundant food, um, food excess, you're not now burning, using that fat up, so it builds up, right? So what it does is ends up messing up all the processes as well, so they're not as circadian. We're finding, another cool story came after that, we found that the vision of the flies also improves on dietary restriction and was regulated by these circadian factors. So we're finding a lot like the gut, again, very circadian in nature, so for example, um, you take in food, the gut and the liver are busy now, breaking down, right? And then when, it, when you starve, that's, or when you stop eating, I mean, then you, the, the body takes a break and starts going into the, switching the mode to burn fat, and that's when a lot of cells repair. So the other thing we're finding is a lot of the repair processes become active at night, and What's interesting to think of is, you're all, you're all aware of circadian rhythms and the light is a big driver of that. But the other thing to remember is, food is also a big driver for that. Because food, when, whenever food comes in, we are diurnal animals, so we get switched on to go into that metabolic mode that get busy breaking down the food. Repair processes are shut off, it's more like how to get energy now, right? But so this, this, these uh, rhythms are very important. That, that was the, sort of the, the idea behind this, uh, which is shown on the right. So they live longer as well. You can see the miles, those are like how long they live. So these flies were living about 70 odd days, and these flies on the left only live about 40 odd days. And the graveyard comes after 40, you can see. <laughs> so so, um, so yeah. for folks who are thinking about starting this, going okay, Yeah but they've never done it before. What's yeah, so your advice? Yeah, actually, so I'll tell you a personal story. I, I you know, was fascinated by intermittent fasting. There's one very clear reason why it's really good, which is um, what you're trying to do with intermittent fasting um, is fool the body, um, how should I put it this way? Let me put it this way. I used to eat, I, you know, I would get up early and I would eat my breakfast. And I was like, hey, I'm doing the right thing. I'm eating my breakfast and, and it's like six, seven o'clock. And then I realized that that is not the best thing because I get more hungry after I do that. And, and, and this is what's being noticed. If you eat more meals in a day, it, you know, that's the advice we've been given in, in, in some cases. And for diabetics, it might be good. But maybe for normal people, it's not a good idea to eat more meals a day because it's easier to eat more that way. So, so number one thing, so then I, it, I mean basically what, what made sense was their finding when people are told to not eat for let's say 14 hours or 16 hours. So th th this study uh, it was fascinating where they chose people who had BMI of over 30 and they told them you can't, just don't eat for these 14, 16 hours, but you can eat as much as you want between eight to two. And they found that these people did a lot better because they were eating in a consolidated window. They were not even asked to eat less. But that consolidated window artificially tell, makes you eat less, number one. But secondly, it improves the rhythm. 
because now the body is getting a break. If you constantly keep on putting, let's say sugar, your pancreas, your liver, your gut, everything has to work all the time. You're not giving it time to rest. And that, that's, the, that's the main idea behind restricted feeding, that you, you need to give time off, a time out essentially for the... Um, so, so then I, basically like I said, then I, uh, so I started doing intermittent fasting and I was, I was doing well. And then the, another thing I, I ended up doing, which was a mistake, which is I would break my fast and then I would eat as much as I want. And I might saw my sugar would spike. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? And then I realized the healthy breakfast with all the fruits and all, I was like, you know, the, the granola you get. And it's not, it's not necessarily healthy. And also it's the, pr- the portion is very important. So any, any advice on diet, I wanna say, always start with portion control. The number one thing is the total amount of calories, which, you know, lots of fancy things come in, do this or do that or do it this way, but the number one thing is really total calories. So if restricted eating can help you cut down that calories and have better control, I think it's good. So I, I mean, I found that if you're disciplined about it, I, I do think, I mean, I as time has gone, I started with this only thinking about food and diseases, but I think one of the most uh, fascinating things is mental alertness and actually, uh, like, um, you know, discipline. Somehow it's easier to get um, things done if you are, if you, you're more focused when you are eating less. And, and this also has an evolutionary benefit. I mean, the reason, think about this again, um, always think about when you don't have food in the wild, what will happen? You get switched on. So what's happening is you, your memory improves, and this has been shown in humans. Short term, you know, like even uh, in a few months, if you eat less calories, your short term memory improves. And you can see why. You want to make sure you can find this food if you find, found the food somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to forget, right? So we found the vision improves. Of course, you got to go find that food, right? So, so we found the flies, not only are they healthier, but their vision in them, they, they get out of bed quickly, like, we, we can see this in flies because we're constantly monitoring their acti- activity, so, uh, you know, a, a meter is measured. And we saw that those flies that were eating less, six o'clock in the morning, they're out of bed, like, you know, to, to find food, right? It's unfortunate, it's not around in, our, in, their, in their wild, but, so their memory improves, their vision improves, and they're more physically active. So what's very interesting is how diet can influence behavior and vice versa. I think we need to constantly be thinking, but it's a, it's a very good way to sort of motivate yourself to do more exercise, eat less, because it's just much, much easier. So somebody, yeah. somebody asked fasting, how strict? So yeah, do you, so I think, yeah. yeah, this one is definitely, you know, be careful as there's more data coming on, on this. Um, you know, when you're younger, there are fewer problems. Again, it's age you know, sex dependent, it, there's lots of things that come into play. But I would, I would say start more gradually. So um, I have a, I've told it, I, I use, I share this with everyone I know. So like, you know how, so even the person where I go shop or my neighbor, so when my, my neighbor has been like, has become a devout, like sort of follower of this. And what we realize is like earlier on, when we switch right away, some people tend to get headaches. And it's because your body is getting used to, I mean, it's used to, believe it or not, guess how many, guess how many hours, um, so if you just, the polls been like, you know, people have recorded how much they eat and what times they eat. So the shocking part was like 20 to 30% of the, of the population eats literally 16 hours a day. We're not fasting, they're not even doing 12, 12 and all that. Those are often the, that's where the problem is, and especially eating late at night. From everything I told you, right, if you're not giving your gut, your liver, your pancreas a break in after evening, you're just making it harder for, it, for you to go to sleep and for you to switch over. Like I said, this, it is a very privileged time. Even if you don't, even if your sleep is not good, the best thing is to at least take out the food so that your body can at least do what it's capable of doing when it's fasting. So, um, sorry, I start it. slow. <laughs> yeah, start slow. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you know, it, it, some people do one meal a day. I mean, I, I can't do one meal a day, but uh, you know, if it works for some people, they they say. I, I think it's 
it's important to constantly assess how you are doing. So if you are feeling weak, if you're not feeling energetic, there's something wrong. You should be feeling more energetic, you should be feeling more uh, sharper. Um, so there are short-term benefits you sh we have access to right now. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's there. Yeah. Um, so you, I think that's important. So I would say if, when someone is to start, start, you know, 12, 12. I, like my mom would not listen. Yeah, my mom doesn't listen to me no matter what I, how much I publish, she would not listen to me and she would always have a counter argument. Um, <laughs> But slowly I, I started her like, okay, just do 12, 12. And then she said, yeah, you know, it's working. I, I feel a little better. So then, you know, then you go to 13 hours, you go to 14 hours and just see what you can do. And, and one of the other uh, tricks I've learned is um, you, don't, um, you don't have to maybe totally cut out food. Um, you can, if, for example, I think low carb at night is a very good idea, right? And that also will help you, you know, like I said, you want to switch over to the fat burning state. So if low carb just means, you know, if we've got any, um, one of the things about nutrition, I just want to say all the things that we learn there, it is so arbitrary, right? We think, oh, our, our ancestors did this or that. They didn't, right? We, <laughs> agriculture only started recently. Before, what were people doing before that? We were not eating this much bread. We didn't have this much access to to meet, you know, nobody was, my kids would eat sushi three times a day if we could get it to them, right? So this was, this is a very artificial situation. So it's good to always sort of give that perspective. Where, where is this idea coming into my head that I got to drink this much milk or this much, uh, you know, eat, eat this much bread, otherwise I can't function. Um, so I, I think uh, putting that into perspective, and, and, and so I, what I'm saying is you can, you, you can cheat a little bit in, in terms of having calorie, um, um, what I call calorie, well, like sort of more salad kind of foods, right? Food that are, have more nutrition, but less calories in them. So that, that also works. So you don't have to, uh, if, if you know, you don't feel like you'd, you'd like to restrict, but some people find it very convenient to restrict. So when I told like some people like they say, yeah, I don't have to eat breakfast, I am really glad. I have to you know, focus on only two meals a day, that saves me a lot of time. And that, you know, so I think a lot of it is personal, but I think it's, it's good to constantly assess and also like, you know, talk to your doctor, but also look at your, your blood levels, right? You know, the, all the sugar and everything else, if everything is going, is going okay, right? Because there, there is an element, for example, um, when you're fasting or you're in that state, you can also, you don't want, you can push yourself too far because you're, you're hypervigilant essentially. Right, so you could one idea is that your stress hormones could also go up in that time. Right, so there is a balance to be maintained here, and and the the problem is is different for everyone. We we've, we've done this in in flies and people as well. Not everyone responds equally, and not everyone's going to get the same benefits. Right, that means for we're finding this in flies. Like so, some some uh, some animals were very good at like improving their mental function. Some improved their physical activity. So, but I think what we're finding though is it's generally beneficial, and you can benefit in one way or the other. But it's not going to be exactly the same across people. So I think, which is which is the challenge, but also the fun part, like working out what you want to do. But this is where a lot of the I think the research needs to understand these things better. And one of the things we do is understand natural genetic variation. So the reason every, it's different for everyone is our diversity, which is what gives us the beauty, but it's also part of the reason why we all don't respond differently. But it also means, you know, let's say tomorrow, some food, food types disappear. Not everyone's gonna die here. Some people are gonna, you know, make it. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, now we get to some uh, questions. I told you we were going to get that. Somebody wants to know about alcohol. I see this. You know, first thing I see this. Uh, one thing came uh, comes to my mind. I don't know how many people know about the Columbine Exchange, right? What, what's fascinating. This is another thing about nutrition. Most people don't. Know. I mean, I tell them they they. They said, we're going to go check it up and believe, to believe this. Most of the things here that we now found all over the world were never there before. Only, only in the 1600s, 1700s, 
this started happening after Columbus came. Stuff, most of this stuff, most chilies that you're seeing, potatoes even, right? People think potatoes are somehow from Europe or all that. No, no, most of that came from South America. And it's fascinating to think that what were people eating before? But, but um, so that's the first thing I just want to get across, just to get, you know, um, history is fascinating to the history of how we've eaten across this. It's fascinating. It also, the reason I think it's worth um, delving into this is it makes you think about your choices. And the one thing I want to bring in sort of in behavior, I'm, I'm sort of going off topic a little bit, but it's um, the reason, like, I, I want to, um, I used to think a lot more about just food before, like, eat this, and, and, but it's not as simple. We are not, we're not robots, right? We can't be just told to eat this and that. There's a big part of all this is, lack of a better word, addiction, or what we like, our choices, right? We're addicted to certain things, or our, and, and we want to be in a state where not, you're not addicted, you're not working on automatic which means when you see food, you should be able to like distance yourself. And this is kind of a mental thing. So what I wanna bring in is the idea that uh, uh, food addiction is a big part of what tells us to do what we wanna do. And by thinking about the history, by all these things, all you're doing is creating a gap between your response when you see food. You just don't go like this. And if you can just stop this, that's enough actually to cut down weight. This is a you know, fascinating study. So you just should... journaling about what you eat is enough to lose weight. So just so you know, when we were preparing for this, I asked PK, I go, well, do you have any favorite cookbooks that you know, we can recommend? And he said, well, I'm reading a lot about stoic philosophy. <laughs> so, so talk about just, you know, yeah. you, you sort of mentioned it, but how do you approach this? I, I think a lot of it, like what I said, I'm learning um, is, you know, I think a lot, you can hear, you can see this in social media and influences, you're almost, there's a lot of anxiety created around how we eat. There's a lot of blame put around people who are not eating well, right? But whereas we're not really, I feel not getting to the problem, like I said, we're wired to do all these things. This is how our genetic makeup is. But one thing which I find, fascinating, and this is also something in psychology, what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. All, but all what you're doing is, um, you call it, it's also what's in mindfulness or stoicism, you wanna create a gap between the stimulus and response, right? That gap creation is all you need. The minute if you can think about, even if you're taking chocolate, um, this is something I only learned very recently, Instead of chewing on the chocolate, just, you know, you can enjoy it for longer. I mean, I'm not very good at doing that, but just enjoying the food for longer are one, one of the simplest things that actually helps you cut down calories. So all these tricks, they're actually, they, if you think of it this way, then it's not, you're not using force and deliberation, but you can actually enjoy more, but you can, you know, less is more. And that's somehow, um, bringing that into your lifestyle in a way that, that you're not fighting against yourself, that it's not creating anxiety. Anxiety is a big problem. Like I said, it's, there's a really fascinating study I wanna share. They did a study with people, they, they gave, uh, there were two groups of people, they gave the same um, shake, which was uh, essentially a bad shake. So imagine a McDonald's shake, right? But one group of people, they said, this is you know really a bad, uh, a food choice, right? And another group of people, they said, this is health food. Shockingly, I, I, I'm still blown away, but that the results showed that these people did not elevate their glucose. Those who thought they were eating a health food, they actually did better. And there are a few studies like this. So, so you know, your mindset is so important. Mind over matter is, you know, not something I want to discount just because, um, like I said, there's a lot of anxiety created around food, um, which we need to overcome and so that you can, event, the goal is to have something sustainable. There's no point going, getting on a diet and doing it for two months and then going back, right? So you wanna make choices that are sustainable and that you, you, you are happy with and, and they're adding to your life rather than you know, make you feel like you're taking away something, right? So stoicism comes 
very much, you know, I, I mean, I it's highly, whatever works for you, you know, mindfulness, stoicism, just gratitude, for example, being thankful to get the food. These are very simple things, but I, one of the things I'm, I think very important to think to instill even when kids are, you know, when you're kids, because though they become habits, right? These habits then take you to one path or the other. So food a lot, is a lot about, you know, thinking a lot about habits and our mental makeup and, and um, addiction can potentially help you with a lot, a lot of this, I think. So now we got to talk about alcohol. Uh, can well, we? I think can, I answered the question. I? <laughs> I know. Can we? Can we use mindfulness to convince ourselves that alcohol yeah. is an okay Actually, thing? <laughs> great. Okay, I'll, I'll bring in a stoicism example. Yeah. So this is something I learned. So you know, everyone. Um, you know, this was philosophy written by the Romans, and and and, the, and to, there will be a link to a book in the email that yeah. I sent out. And, and and they used to wine and dine, and and then I learned something very interesting. Right now. Does anybody here water down their wine? Right? People think that's sacrilege, right? So, oh, you, okay, so someone who, someone does this right. So apparently in those times, it was considered indulgence to, to drink alcohol and wine straight. You, had, you should always water it down. And I was like, wow, no, why does nobody ever tell me this? Or, you know, that is because we don't want to talk about these things. No, stoicism is the most unpopular thing because because it's all about controlling yourself, and you know, it only appeals to a very, is a, you know, it's not something that's going to be very popular. But, <laughs> but alcohol. But so. alcohol. So same thing. I think so. So coming back to alcohol, the point is, um, you know, how to cut. So my, I don't drink much at all, and now more and more studies are coming that any amount is pretty much bad. So what I would, best thing I, uh, you know, maybe once a, week, once a week or once a month, that's about all your body is really capable of handling. handling. So we're working on this in the lab as well, and what's fascinating is the same pathways that were important for detoxification of ages and sugar are the ones that are important for detoxification of alcohol. So you push your system by taking more alcohol, those enzymes get depleted, you can't deal with other things. And there, then I read, and you know, and this is also something personal, but you know, I've, I've seen detrimental effects of this in like close friends, and I, I just think it's, you know, the shockingly, like more than 10% of the population is, is what you would say has a substance abuse disorder. And, and I, I think, um, I'd say more than, you know, 30, 40% have a problem. But we are not ready to acknowledge it because it's it doesn't get too you know something dangerous. But but I think so. Finding ways to water down the alcohol, finding substitutes. These are ways to think of in cutting down. But the number of people who say how good they feel after they cut down is is also is 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 quite impressive. So you know, people who somehow successfully do it, they always say they feel good. It translates into them being able to. Uh, physically uh, be more active, for example. Because all these things are, like I said, it's a metabolic load on your body and, and you can't do other good things that you want to do. We got some questions about protein. Protein yeah. can be a big deal for older adults. We are told, you know, we're losing muscle mass, so you got to get protein. But then what protein's the right protein? How much protein? How, how should people here s start thinking about yeah. protein? So I, I think this is where, I think it's one of the most debatable things I think in the field, partly because a lot of studies now in flies, mice, and even in humans show that actually high protein intake is tied with shorter life, right? But, but this is high protein intake at different, then they looked at it more carefully at different stages. And I think a lot of our guidance is coming from early on, it was like, it's Think about a lot of the guidance comes from what's good for growth. It's not the same thing that's good for you after you're 30, 40, 50, right? That's not, you don't metabolize things the same way. But it's important for, like I have to think at home, I have two daughters, like totally different meal for them versus me. Like they wanna eat, uh, you know, they want everything, like I said, fried, and they, you know, as, as, as rich as it can be, and I'm like, I feel sick after I eat the, the, that food. But um, they'll not eat if I give them carrots, essentially, right? So, 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 the, so, um, 
so thinking about lost protein again the yeah so protein um so so then people have done more studies on where should the protein come from so it looks like the best uh, some of the best studies i've seen and i think it's maybe the best way to take protein is take plant protein right and especially lentils legumes i think you don't have to even worry about how much you're consuming if you're eating the plant based protein because you're getting whole food right if you're eating lentils you you usually don't have these kind of uh, problems so the problem comes maybe with again more red meat more dairy so if if we were, if, so this has been done many times in terms of a, like on a scale what's the worst sources of protein or or diet uh, in the diet so red meat dairy and then comes i think poultry and then fish and then the best is actually plant based proteins so um so if you can find ways to do that i mean like i i made it a habit to make more lentil soups right so it's it's it requires work you know but you can get healthy protein that way and the other part with the protein i i also want to say uh, another reason everybody differs on this is not to do with the data everybody wants different things as well and everybody is different right so some people for example especially when we talk to aging i think one of the first questions that should come up is not i want to age slow which we uh, which often when we say it's more like really what what functions are you really interested in prioritizing and that's when you start seeing the answers are different and that's what you need to do is different some people really want to be able to lift more when they're older they want to be more active now their protein need is going to be higher now one other very interesting study came with this you can take in more protein if as long as you are exercising more if because you need to have ways to burn this so people who they the study was basically if you have high protein this is more in rodents but if you're not then exercising your risk of type 2 diabetes goes up right so it's it's what you do with that protein is going to be very important but uh, one way to eat protein to sort of build muscle mass is always eat protein after the exercise so like a couple of a few hours starting from a few hours right after you exercise that's when protein synthesis is highest so you want to take your meal um, you know a good protein meal afterwards so that it becomes more gets utilized appropriately so i think there there you know we're trying to there's more research needed in all this but i think it's very important to think about how to optimize um, it's also like um, like i said what people want out of some of a work some if you're doing an endurance workout you know it's it's very different ways to deal with it if you want to do for example fat burn uh, fat burn so for example one of the things i started doing and and it i i totally don't know why i didn't it before but before exercise there's a tendency to eat and i i stopped doing that i said okay let's just because i was seeing these studies that your levels of ketones and everything goes up even more if you are fasted overnight let's send you were to do exercise but some people you know it doesn't like i said once your body is used to that you find even a, a greater rush from that but i'm i'm not advocating for that but i'm just saying if you want to lose fat then that's a good way to do it otherwise you know you can do it um normally as you but um just adding to that like uh, uh, just to sort of make the most of your um, avoid f- sugar spikes and e- eat well when your uh, studies also show that if you eat the way after your meals walking after that is the best way to sort of reduce um, the spikes having high uh, more fiber um, and like i said you know all those other things about eating slower and all that these simple things can prevent uh, sugar spikes eating fiber before a meal actually the order in which we should be eating is uh, fiber protein and then carbs and we often do it the other way around but yeah salad comes as a yeah so what's your opinion of and we got questions about this about the kind of fake meat that you yeah. can buy plant based meat yeah. somebody goes isn't that really processed do you have any opinion on that stuff i mean i i i think it's an interesting idea it's more for avoiding uh, you know um i guess to to reduce animal food consumption but um i i think it, i i am concerned myself i use those the burgers and it's the this it is highly processed and uh, like i said if you could do lentils or you know like one of the thing 
things I do a lot is just take salad and then find like, you know, chickpeas, beans or whatever, and just put that onto the salad or, or tofu and stuff. Those are easier ways to get protein and, 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 and you know, not put the carbs rather than the, 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 beyond, the fake meat. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, next slide, Jorn. So, Pankaj has a clinical trial. And he's going to tell us about it. It's called Gly Glycation Lowering Intervention for Delaying Effects on Ovarian Health. So did you, first of all, did you ever think when you started studying aging that you would be dealing with ovarian health? Or No, it, it, this is again one of those things in the lab we think about uh, in terms of evolution. And, and one of the interesting things um, what I've learned, so you know, we're interested in aging, but you have to always think of where to optimize and find the best ways to study this, right? We're using invertebrates. But in, in, in humans, we think one very interesting um, state is menopause. When, wh what happens after that? So one of the things I like to ask people is like, what do you think is the most important organ in the body? Right, everybody, most people will say heart, brain, and all that. And I, I think, Again, from an evolutionary point of view, I think the ovary is the most important organ because we wouldn't be here without the ovary, right? <laughs> so, the, which means we're wired, the body is wired to think about the ovary, not your heart and the brain. It's making sure that you continue the species, right? Everything we talk about, it's all wired for that. So now think, menopause is a very interesting situation. Ovaries have stopped working. What's going to happen next? So we, what we're finding is the brain tries to keep restarting the ovary and accelerates aging in a very uh, rapid manner. And that's why it's a very interesting state. A lot of things that are seen in other, in aging states, in, uh, we think you can see it much faster in that postmenopausal state. And that's why you know, the risk of dementia goes uh, higher, diabetes, you know, brain fog, a lot, actually alcohol, another one of those things um, where we even see this in the mouse. You're sensitive to alcohol after menopause, way more sensitive because your ability to detoxify is, is reduced. So, so we're, we are, so we're, you know, to make the most of an intervention. So this intervention that we have here reduces glycation. Um, it's even commercially available, available as a product called Glylo, uh, which meant glycation lowering compounds. It's a cocktail of for uh, five supplements because we wanted something safe in people. Uh, previously, trials on reducing glycation didn't go further in humans because of side effects. So we started with these compounds that are safe and we said, okay, let's, if glycation is really bad for you, what can we see? So in mice, we're seeing amazing data. They, we can extend lifespan by 30, 40%. Their eyes are, are look younger. Their different parts of the body we looked at, the brain, um, the brain looks like that of a younger uh, animal. We can slow the onset of diabetes. We can, uh, these animals are more active. They seem to run more. Uh, so, um, and diabetes, uh, insulin sensitivity is improved. So we're now, we were looking at where, where should we study this in humans. So we're starting this in, in menopausal women because like I said, that transition, one of the things, interesting things we're finding is glylo also reduces the, so there's a hormonal imbalance. So the brain, tries to push up like what's called follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and that's been shown to accelerate multiple aging outcomes, including diabetes, muscle, and, and fat loss. Same thing, it's also relevant in humans. So we're finding that with, by giving these uh, glycation reducing compounds, you can bring that down. And we did a very small trial, so it also seems like working in, in women. So we wanna now do a, a more, what we'd call a, a randomized, uh, control trial where some people would take the pill, but they don't know if they're taking the pill or they're taking the, the placebo. So we, we are, we're doing, a, with the help of uh, Brianna and John Newman, do a, a double blind trial um, to study, study endpoints after six months. So some of the pre preliminary data we saw was people were more alert actually in the, in the short time. Um, like I said, uh, their bone mass density also improved we think like they're from our mouse data, muscle mass improves as well. It's one of the concerns about weight loss drug, uh, weight loss, this, this, these compounds also reduce calorie intake, but we think it's not at the cost of the muscle. So we wanna, you know, attack the fat and, and break the, improve fat metabolism, but not 
but keep your muscle intact. Some of the newer drugs that are on, one of the problems with like the Ozempic-like drugs is they're saying that they potentially have a muscle uh, loss problem. But I, I think, I mean, again, those things should be discussed with their doctor and what's best for you, but I'm, we're just saying we're interested in trying to make um, things that would be, would improve health span, but as, as well at the same time save uh, not at the cost of your muscle, but improve your insulin sensitivity. So this is something we're excited so, about. Starting. So yeah. the, we will be looking for 30 postmenopausal women, age 45 to 65, with a body mass index of either equal or greater than 27. So if you have questions about this particular clinical trial or you're interested, there's yeah. gonna be folks out in the atrium who can talk to you about this afterwards and can give you information about uh, our think, general yeah. general trials. Plus, I want to say the supplement that's being tested, Pankosh, like other faculty members here, has spun off a company. So he's produced this supplement. It's, it's not directly associated with Buck, but but he's here. So right. that's that's with that. Yeah. And I wanted to add with the, another reason for the study menopause is, you know, half the population goes through it and there's very little out there for women. I, I think potentially one of the exciting things I feel is women live longer. What's very interesting is women live longer, but one of the thoughts is that maybe in poorer health. So their health span is not the same as, as men's, but they live long. But maybe with some interventions like this, we could have an improvement in their lifespan and health span, and, um, it, which, which is, I think, much needed in, in the society. But it's also, I mean, I take this, so I just want to say it's also useful for men. It could just be, we're interested in finding certain stages where it could be more relevant, if, yeah, where you get the best effects. Next slide, please. So, um, we just talked about PK's clinical trial coming up. The next community seminar, which will be in October, is going to be all about our clinical trials. So we're doing a number of trials focused. Brianna Stubbs will be here to, to talk with me, so I hope you can all come back for that. Um, Brianna is currently in Wales running an ultra marathon yeah. across the across the hills of Wales. Hopefully she'll make it back and she'll be she'll be in good shape for the next one. Okay. Um, thanks, PK, for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Next slide, please. So, I would be remiss if I did not urge you to please consider becoming a donor to the buck. Your gifts make a difference here. Philanthropy has enabled PK to do that pilot study. Your gifts really do start small things that grow to big things. I uh, included a photo here of PK with Rita Haynes. Shout out to Rita, hopefully she's watching from home. Rita is a longtime donor to PK's lab. Uh, they've become friends. He visits her on occasion and he helps her go through her refrigerator. <laughs> So you never know where these relationships end up. So, well, I mean, so there you go. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I'll tell you a story. It was fascinating. Like, she said, oh, I, I asked her all these questions. Okay, she's doing everything right. So I go, okay, let me check in the refrigerator. And then she, I found this iced tea with a ton of sugar in it. I was like, do you know what this is? I didn't know this had sugar in it. <laughs> so I think we're all doing things like that, which we don't realize we have either blind sights or we don't want to know them, but yeah. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, um, if you want to learn more about aging, we have some great options. We have an online learning class that is getting great reviews. Um, you can access that online. We also have a great podcast called We're Not Getting Any Younger Yet. And uh, we have conversations with some of the leading researchers around the world, literally around the world, that, can, um, that talk about their research and how they're approaching um, aging. Next slide, please. So, if you're new to the bug, please, please consider coming on a tour. They happen Tuesday and Wednesday, Tuesday and Thursday mornings. You can sign up on our website. Uh, reservations are required. And I think that's it for the, for the, is there another slide? I think that's it. Aha, keep up with the buck. So you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, we have blog posts. 
Um, most of all, just please, please come back. So next month is clinical trials. The month after that is all about brain aging. So thank you so very, very much for being here. We got great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but some of the best questions we've ever received. Thank you for being here. Have a great day. Thank you.